Good morning from Fresh Start. What a blessing it is to be back in the house of the Lord. Uh, we're here this morning again on our Matthew Bible study, and we'll be in chapter number 10 this morning. And so if you'll get your Bibles and open up your Bibles with us this morning, uh, we'll get started in this family Bible study hour. And while you're turning, we'll ask Father for his blessings. Precious Father, we come to you thanking you for another blessed day. We ask, Father, that you'd open eyes and open ears to your word. Allow your word to land on fertile ground. And Father, we'll praise you and thank you for all things. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 10, in verse number 1, and it reads, And when he had called unto his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits, to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. And uh, we know that these disciples, they are the disciplined ones. In other words, they are the students. Verse number two. Now, the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and uh, Matthew is giving here the names of the apostles. And, of course, now the word apostles uh, means the, the sent ones. So they have been sent forth. They no longer are students, but they are the ones that are sent forward. Verse 3, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Lebius whose surname was Thaddeus. Four, Simon the Canaanite and Judas Issachrit, who also betrayed him. And uh, these are the twelve that, uh, that was chosen by Christ and that to be apostles, in other words, to go out and to preach the word. Verse number five. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. Reason this was is that, uh, well, you'll, you'll find out here in the next verse why, but they were supposed to put their energy toward the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And uh, the opening up, Salvation to the world had not come yet. Of course, we know that in John chapter 3 and verse 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so the world is whom he is speaking of in that verse, but yet it's not happened yet. So Christ is saying, put all of your energy into this. Verse number 6, But go you rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. <clears throat> I want to... I want to say this morning that this word lost is not the same word that uh, is used as in salvation today. What he is speaking of here is that these people were lost, in other words, not knowing whom they are. And we're going to do a small side study this morning. So if you would, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4. And we'll see the reason why they were scattered abroad. Deuteronomy chapter number 4 and verse 23. And it reads, Take heed unto yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which hath made with you, and make you a graven image, uh, or the likeness of anything, which the Lord thy God had forbidden thee. This, the covenant of the, of the Lord your God. This here brings in the wealth and the happiness that is needed in a person's life to withstand this, this way of the world. This also can be a retirement. Uh, for those, and you know, I, I was mentioning that to, to someone earlier this week that there's nothing in the Word of God that teaches us uh, to place back for retirement and to put up for retirement other than this of the covenant. 
that if we do our work, if we do our job, uh, what we're supposed to do for the Lord, be a service to him. The Bible says in the book of the Revelation that uh, our works will follow us. And uh, these are those that we're talking about. He says that he did, uh, and which made with you and make you a graven image or likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. This graven image is, is anything worshipped or put forth that was made by man. In other words, you put first uh, uh, that brand new boat or uh, the brand new house or the brand new car. There's nothing wrong with having these items. These items are not a curse if you don't worship them. We are not to put people or items or money before the Lord. God must be first in your life. And when you place God first in your life and you exercise it to that way, blessings come your way. Verse 24, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. We read that in Hebrews 12 and 29. But not only is God a consuming fire, but the Holy Spirit is, when it comes to you and I, is a warming to you and I. This, this warming is something that you and I strive for. Uh, it's something that we desire uh, in our daily walk, as often as we can uh, muster it up, per se. Uh, but what is needed is, is that you stay in God's Word. And when you stay in the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will warm you. And that's exactly what he's saying here. Verse 25, When thou shalt uh, begot children and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves and make a graven image or any likeness of anything, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God to provoke him to anger, to, bro to provoke him to jealousy. Verse 26, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land wherein unto you go over to Jordan to pass it, yet shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. And if one does, now we're, what we're reading here is that the, the disobedience of the children of Israel when they were led out of, uh, of Egypt. And... Uh, what Father is trying to say here is that through their heathenism and the way that they were, were brought up, uh, they didn't know much more different to, than what was told to them. But you and I today, this can be applied to our life. Verse 27, And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and you shall be left few in number among the heathen, whether the Lord shall lead you. This is the very reason why the apostles need to go to the lost house of the sheep of uh, Israel. And it's because that, well, Israel does not know who they are. They do not know from what tribe they are from. And uh, the reason why that is is because of the disobedience of our forefathers. And Father has given them the reason why. And... Uh, he said in the Lord, verse 27, And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations. And he did. He did scatter them among the nations in 745 to 722 B.C. And when they were released and placed, they were placed in the northern Iraq. And uh, then they migrated through the Caucasus Mountains and down through the Europe's and made up of the Christian nations. But yet they were so scared of being back in captivity, they dropped a lot of their names and therefore uh, brought about uh, the absence of uh, knowing who they are. Verse 28, And there shall ye serve gods, uh, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, uh, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. Doesn't that sound like today? Doesn't that sound like uh, what the world is seeing today, that how they worship more uh, of the creation that 
uh, man has made uh, than the creator himself. 29. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. I, I, I don't know if you underline or not, but that's a good verse to underline. If you seek the Lord, you will find him. Father is not going to push one away uh, uh, that has uh, a desire to know more of his word. He wants you to know his word. He wants you to be fluent in his word. 29 again, but if, thou, if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Verse 30, when thou art in tribulation... And all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days. If thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice, this is what is asked for you to do, even during this tribulation that's coming. This tribulation that's coming does not have to be a, a forceful tribulation upon you. If you are aware of what is going to happen. Now, when things attack you and you are unaware of it and you don't know what's happening and um, you're not prepared, then therefore it can be tribulation. It can be trouble in your life. 31, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee. He will not forsake thee. This is a promise that God has made. Now, unlike... Man or woman, you know, they can make a promise and then kind of go back on it. Father cannot go back on his promises. Reason being because he's made it a covenant to, with you. He said, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant uh, of thy fathers which he swear unto them. He is always reminded. Verse 32, for ask now of the days uh, that are past which were before thee since the day that God created man upon the earth and asked from the one side of heaven uh, unto the other whether there hath been any such thing as this great thing is or hath been heard like it, question. 33, did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire? as thou hast heard and to live, question? Or hath God assayst to go to take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, and by wonders, and by war, and by mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? And God's reminding these of what he had done, how that he parted the waters and he hardened the heart of Pharaoh and, and caused his army in that to be uh, taken over by the waters as he uh, split the waters and uh, allowed the children of Israel to go by and uh, in a cloud for coverage in the day and a pillar of fire at night and the manna. And I could go on and on and on and on. The many things that Father done but yet they were disobedient. 35, unto thee it was shewed that thou mightest know the Lord, he is God. There is none else besides him. And uh, you, you can see it today that there are some people that still have terra firms in their home. In other words, house gods and uh, little things like that that uh, God's not happy with. Uh, these, these things that people use for entertainment or for decoration or for whatever reason, if it goes against God's word, then friends, we are not supposed to be a part of it. The very first commandment that God put in his word, in the book of Exodus, chapter 12, he said that, uh, excuse me, chapter 20, he said, let there be no other gods before me, for I am a jealous God, 
And God is a jealous God. He's a loving God. He doesn't want somebody to put their faith and their hope into something that is paganism or that is heathenism. Thirty six. Out of heaven he made thee to hear his voice, that he might instruct thee, and upon the earth he shewed thee his great fire, and thou hardest heardest his words uh, out of the midst of the fire. Thirty seven. And because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them, and brought thee out of thy his sight with his mighty power out of Egypt. Thirty eight. To drive out nations uh, from before the greater and mightier than thou, than thou art, to bring thee in, to give thee their land for an inheritance as it is this day. 39. Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart, that the Lord, he is God in heaven, above and upon the earth beneath. And there is none else. That's not a hard concept, but yet people allow traditions of man to work into their belief and it leads them astray from giving honor to the true and living God. When one takes the most holy day, the most high day that God has set aside as Passover, and you institute it as a heathen uh, uh, Ishtar day and to insert the resurrection on Ishtar day father's not happy with these kind of things father wants you to do it the right way and the more that you do it the right way the more that father is pleased verse 40 thou shalt keep therefore his statues and his commandments which I command you this day that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. My mind goes back to many generations that have exercised this idea of Easter and this idea of paganism. And children were brought up in these things and didn't know the difference. And but until... The word of God is brought forth properly and for you to know that you are not supposed to partake in a Ishtar festival, in a grove worship, uh, the rolling of the eggs and uh, uh, the, the fertility bunny and things of that nature. God's not in that. God does not appreciate that. And especially on the most high day uh, of Passover, the reason why that the house of Israel was lost, the ten northern tribes, is because of the disobedience. Father is doing his best to try to draw you this morning and try to draw you back to where he belongs. <clears throat> so back in Matthew chapter 10, we'll read verse 6 again. He said, But go you rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and that is exactly what the apostles are to do. And the word of God is to come our way so that we are fluent and understand uh, what it is that pleases Father. Seven. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, herald it. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it was at hand at that time. It was there with them. But we, after the death on the cross, we know that the uh, kingdom of heaven is right at the hand. It is right there, uh, and it's for you and I. It's for you and I to uh, place our hope and our trust in, to know that if we do things that Father has asked us to do, do it the way that he has asked, then everything will be fine. Verse 8. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. That's exactly how he had placed it. He's saying that I gave it to you, then therefore go out and give it to uh, those that have need of it. And uh, 
this raising of the dead. And there's been some raised from the dead around here. And I'm not talking about the physical. I'm talking about the spiritual dead. Those that were spiritually dead come alive. They came alive as in, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 37, as talked about how that these uh, bodies and these people are in a valley, the valley of death, and these people had no idea of the word of God. But God told Ezekiel, he said, prophesy to them. Read them the word of God. Teach them how these things ought to be. And we'll see whether or not they come alive. And sure enough, he asked him, he said, do you think that they'll come alive? He said, uh, you only know, Lord. And he said, you prophesy to them. And as he had prophesied and he spoke the word of God, and understanding came, that warmth came to these individuals. Again, there's been many people that have come from the dead. In other words, that the, they once were blind, but now they see. They understand the word of God. Verse 9. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in your purses. In other words, uh, you don't have to go out and provide, uh, uh, ask for provisions or to take anything with you. Father will provide everything you have need of. 10 nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, uh, neither yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And that's exactly what he said, that when one goes out and teaches the word of God like it ought to be, uh, they shouldn't uh, have to worry whether or not they have packed enough clothing or if they have enough money in their purse or if they are doing the thing that they ought to. Put all these things behind you. The scriptures teach us that seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these other things will be added unto you. If you have a desire to teach, and you have a desire to help others and uh, to bring out and bring forth God's word, there should be no need in a ministry to worry about whether or not money is going to come in or uh, if you're going to get enough tithes and things of that nature. Uh, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't play uh, on that. What you are to put your focus and energy on is the Word of God. You teach it like it ought to be taught, and Father will handle the rest. I guarantee it. Father will handle everything you have need of. There's not a ministry out here that is teaching the truth and not traditions of man that is not provided for. Father does that. He's good that way. He said he would, and he does. Verse 11, and into whatever city or town ye enter, ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. In other words, uh, be a fruit inspector. Know whether or not these people will accept the word of God. Uh, there are many cities and towns in this nation that uh, a man of God uh has no need to go in because they're not going to accept him. Uh, they've been overtaken by evil, uh, by gangs and things of that nature, and they very well may not accept. But what he's saying here, inquire who it is, uh, is worthy. Verse 12, and when you come into a house, salute it. In other words, uh, 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 salute it and it, uh, Ask God's peace on this house is what he's saying. Salam, in other words. And if you do these things, uh, uh, this house will be blessed. Verse 13, and if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. And that's what he's asked. Let your peace come and, and, and ask Father to bless that home. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return unto you. If they don't receive God's word, don't ask God to bless it. And that's exactly what he said. In that, in that day, it was prevalent that people would take in travelers and uh, men of the cloth, uh, teachers, per se, and uh, they would uh, go and, and they'd put out a, a big uh, uh, meal and they would 
have their home all decorated up and, and provided and provisions made for the man of God. And there's what he is saying. He's saying here that when you go, go in, and if they accept you, then you should stay there. Verse 14, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. And there are places today, and there are churches uh, that will not accept uh, the true word of God. But what he is saying here, he says, uh, Whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. In other words, this is a figure of speech. But it also can be an act that is done. In other words, I'll have nothing more to do with them. That's what you're saying. I'll, I've, I've, I've tried, and, and they don't listen. Therefore, shake off the dust from your feet. Fifteen, verily, in other words, truly, I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city, for not receiving the word of God. And... Uh, Always remember that God is keeping a wonderful record. That what you do, you should not wonder and, and go back in your mind and wonder whether or not uh, this is going to prosper or if it's going to work or uh, if you're going to be uh, provided for. Or it, that's not the worry. That's not the concern. The concern is, is whether or not they will accept the word of God. Verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpent and harmless as a dove. A sheep is very vulnerable. They don't have any defense mechanism whatsoever. And they rely on the shepherd. And as we are in that position, I want to read Psalms 23 this morning in your hearing so that you understand what it is that the sheep are relying on. Psalms 23 and 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want for anything if I do God's will. Verse 2, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. The green pastures are the best pastures. It's the ones that you are fed from. That's where you get the word pastor, from pastures. And he leadeth me beside the still waters. In other words, the waters of rest. 3, he restoreth my soul. He gives eternal life. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Four, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. This valley of the shadow of death, as I've mentioned before, is in Ezekiel 37. And that's exactly where a lot of people are. And I, I want you to put into your mind, understand that he's talking about that of Satan, the valley of death, the valley of Satan, that where it's got people so wrapped up in the world that they do not know the word of God. They do not understand that there is a free pardon of sin. And that there is a God that loves them and provides for them if they will do God's will. Again, verse 4, he said, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, because you know the truth and follow him. That's why God is with you. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Five. 
Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And God does. He will feed those uh, that have that desire that gave their heart and their soul to God. Those that seek the Lord with all their heart and with all their soul, they will be fed in the amongst of the, 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 in the, amongst of the enemies even. A table will be prepared for you. And when God prepares a table for you, you do eat, friend. You eat from the manna of above. Five, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Anointest my head with oil. The oil of his people. The understanding of Christ, the anointed one. Six, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Sounds like a wonderful plan, doesn't it? And it is a wonderful plan if we follow what we're to do. Now, that's why he said uh, to go out and it, it, uh, that the sheep are very vulnerable. Back in Matthew chapter 10, I'll read 16 again. He said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpent and harmless as doves. This wisdom that you are to gain comes from the serpent. And he's speaking that how one is hypnotized. When one is around a, uh, well, like a rattlesnake or something it, uh, that has a defense mechanism, it, it hypnotizes uh, uh, their prey. And uh, that's what Father's wanting you to do, not to hypnotize, not to bring somebody in uh, that is loopy-eyed, but to have them to focus on what you are saying. And he also says here, uh, harmless as a dove, and be as harmless as doves are. And then again, the doves, <laughs> some mother doves that... Can, can, uh, can get very angry and very forceful if you uh, mess with them the wrong way. But again, what the Lord is saying here is for you to be wise and watch what you're saying. Watch what you're doing and be harmless as a dove. Be easy, be calm, and not to get excited, but to let people know that the Lord loves them and that he has a plan. And if you can describe the plan to these individuals, then it's a blessing. That's what God expects of you. Verse 17. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in, uh, scourge you in their synagogues. Beware of men. For they will deliver you up to councils. In 2 Corinthians 11. In verse number 14. It says here in 2 Corinthians 11 and 14. It says. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into the angel of light. So. As we read here in verse 17, Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And Satan, when he comes, he will come as an angel of light. Who is the angel of light? Jesus Christ. He will come as Jesus Christ. I pray that the majority of you understand that, and that you know that already. That there is one coming that is a fake. He's a liar. He's the instead of, the anti-Christ. And when he comes, he is going to come to devour the world. The Bible says that the world goes uh, following after him. Why is that? Because they have not been taught. And it's our position uh, to teach as much as we possibly can, as often as we possibly can, to teach the truth. And to leave nothing out that people are fully equipped in that day. Because when he comes, he's coming. He'll look like a man. But he will be supernatural. And he will have the ability 
that Father gives him. Now, always remember that Father is in control. You say, well, well why would uh, God allow Satan to come as Antichrist and to fool everybody? Well, Father is giving you a book. It's called the Bible. And there's 66 different books in it. And he's expected you to read it and to learn from it. And to learn what it is uh, that Satan is going to do. Uh, he is going to come and he's going to fool those that have not prepared themselves. It's all in preparation. Have you prepared yourself? Are you aware? Is your family aware? That's the question this morning. Verse 18. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentile. In other words, the nations. Verse 19. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall not be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. Excuse me, I, I misquoted that. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. That hour, meaning the hour of temptation, that uh, will be upon this world in this near future. He is saying here that what ye shall speak is the same thing that is utilized in Acts chapter 2. When they began to speak on the day of Pentecost, it wasn't them that spoke, but it was the Holy Spirit that spoke through them. He said, well, now they were speaking in tongues. Uh, uh, they weren't speaking in tongues, uh, per se, as what the world would want them to uh, understand. They were utilizing different languages, different dialects, different uh, nationalities. And the only way that one could do that is through the Holy Spirit, that when he spoke, it went through to every individual, and they understood. That's exactly how it will be in that day. Verse 20, For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And we also read this in Mark chapter 13 and verse 11. And again, it will not be you that speak, but the Holy Spirit. That what is read there in the book of Joel. Let me read that to you. In the book of Joel, chapter 2. In verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. 29. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens. In those days will I pour out my spirit. Father's leaving none out. It's not about your stability where you are in life. Whether or not you are capable of understanding God's word. God said he would pour out his spirit upon the sons and the daughters. And from the maids and the handmaidens even. Amen. Amen. One has an idea of a waiter. What we are to be are waiters. And while you're waiting on the Lord, you're to serve. Amen? And that's exactly what God has said here. In, in, he would pour out his spirit upon the handmaidens in those days and uh, upon the servants and pour out his spirit. That's exactly what God said he would do if we do his will. 30, and I will shew wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible, in other words, the notable day uh, of the Lord uh, come. 32, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So that's what's going to happen in that day. And that's what he's saying here in Matthew chapter 10. 
that there's going to be a time when we are delivered up. Delivered up for what reason? Well, when the Antichrist is here, he's going to want to know why it is that you do not worship him. And of course, and it's going to be because he's the Antichrist, and uh, it's going to be because that he is not the true Christ, and uh, we are to wait upon the Lord. Isaiah chapter 40, and he talks about how that we are to wait upon him. If we wait upon him, then we endure to the end. So it says. So back in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 20. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. And that's the blessing that we know. That when one is used uh, of God, God will speak through them. We have no idea what the questions may even be. There's no way to rehearse it. There's no way for you to uh, uh, go over it. So therefore, you rely strictly on the Spirit of God. Man. 21. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father uh, the child. And the children shall raise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. This is a very scary scripture for some that do not understand. They say, well, how is it that people are going to kill one another and they're, uh, they're gonna, the children are going to kill the parents? That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying at all. In Hebrews chapter 2, in verse number 14, we see here that Satan is death. That's what he's talking about, that Satan uh, is the one that is death. So as we take this, we, I want to read it to you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to Satan, and the father to the child. And the children shall raise up against their parents and cause them to be put to Satan. In other words, they'll deliver him up. They're going to say, well, uh, he says you're the Antichrist, and he doesn't want uh, anything to do with you. And, of course, the, those of the synagogue and those that are partakers of the Antichrist, they'll say, well, give us his name and uh, let us deal with him. And then that's when the deliverance up will be. And the Bible teaches us in the book of the Revelation that we'll have tribulation for ten days and for ten days only. Verse 22 and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. This again is also mentioned in Mark chapter 13, verse 13. So what's he saying here? But he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. If you do not partake, if you do not partake in anything that he has to offer, and endure to the end then thou shalt be saved. 23. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. And that's exactly his promise. That In that day, there won't be but that ten day of trial. And that when we have escaped from that, then we know that say, that Christ is on his way, that he is nigh to come. We also see this same concept uh, in Revelation chapter 11, uh, that where the two witnesses, uh, we know that this is a timeline for God's children, God's election, that if we see and when we see the two uh, witnesses, the anointed ones, when they are killed and they lie in the street for three and a half days we know that it's nigh at hand that Christ is right around the corner as one would say <clears throat> verse 24 the disciple is not above his master nor the servant above his Lord I'd like to say this morning that there's 
some people that may tune in to maybe this service and say, oh, he's, he's in Matthew chapter 10. I'm not going to put a lot of time into it. I have already know all of that. I already know all there is to know. If we look over here in 1 Corinthians in verse chapter 10 and verse 12, The Bible says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. I want to be sure that people understand that this is not a game. This is not a class that you can just push aside and go on. Friend, there's something that you can learn on every opportunity. Never assume that you are above being taught. There are things that you have no idea of that will be brought out through the Word of God, through the Spirit of God. And there again is what he said, The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It's important that people that learn the Word of God and that are studying, even on the third level, they must realize that they are not above their teachers. They are not above learning. Verse 25, it is enough for the disciple that he be his master and the servant his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? That's what Christ is saying. He's saying that uh, if they have called me Beelzebub, uh, uh, what more are they going to call you? You know what you want to know what this word Beelzebub is? In the Greek, in the Strongs, it's uh, 954. And it means dung God. That's what they're calling him. So if they're going to call that to the master, what more are they going to call you? In other words, we need to be thick skinned. Don't let words bother you. Don't let people calling you names bother you. Stand firm. Do not second guess your teaching. Do not second guess that what you have learned through the scriptures. Stand firm on it. Be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Verse 26. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. You can expect what's prophesied to come your way. If it's prophesied that you will be protected and that you will be provided for, in other words, uh, if you go through the wilderness and to Midbar, know that God is going to be there. He's going to be there for you. Utilize your learnings. Utilize the uh, teaching uh, that has come your way for you to know that you are prepared in that day. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. And all these things are going to be brought out. Again, God keeps wonderful records. Even though you may do it in secret and be just two people uh, uh, in an alley somewhere and uh, somebody is persecuted, don't think that God doesn't see that. God sees it and he knows when his children are being taken advantage of, and he knows when they're being scourged. 27. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And whatever ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the house. In other words, preach the truth. Preach God's word. Teach God's word and not traditions of man. It's traditions of man that makes void God's word. It gives people ideas of believing that they can just sit down and not ever have to be a part of anything or not have to take part in any teaching or any learning. It's important that we continue to learn on a daily basis. You say, well, it's been a while since I've learned anything. 
go back. Go back over what you know and refresh with your mind that what has already been taught. Friends, it never should be a boring time when you're in the Word of God. It never should be a time that is wasted. It is a time that is preparing you, and you just do not know who may come in your way that you have an opportunity to let them know how these things are going to transpire. It's so important that we warn the people. Who are we warning? Who are the people talking to? We're talking to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to those that do not know who they are. We've got a world out here today that's running rampant. They have no idea that Christ is on his way. They have no idea that Christ has made a way for them to escape all of these things that are coming about. They have no idea. They're more involved in their payments and their, their loans. They're more involved in uh, the, the things that they can gain in this earth made by a man's hand, wood and stone, than that of the truth, than that of, word, of the word of God. Verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And who might that be? Well, we read about it in Hebrews 12 and 29. That God is a consuming fire. You say, well, when will this happen? When will God uh, destroy those? Well, for those that need to be destroyed, it will not happen until after the millennial, until after the thousand-year reign of Christ on the great white throne judgment day of God. That's when God will consume those that have no desire and that to worship him. They have uh, never had an opportunity to learn. Therefore, that's what the millennial will be for, will be for them to learn. I'm talking about those of heathen nations and those of all over the world and places that's never heard God's word. Every human being will have that opportunity, and it will be up to them whether or not they will worship God or they will discard God. So he says here in 28, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty easily to take a life of a person. I say easily, the, uh, the, the body is uh, all made up of parts, and uh, you dismember one side or uh, plunge one point, and uh, you take that person's life. That can be done pretty easily. But to destroy the soul, only God can do that. Only God can. The one who made the soul, only God can destroy it. Now, does God get pleasure out of destroying the souls? Of course not. It breaks his heart. It breaks his heart that he has to destroy one of his children. But he does it for the affair of others, so that they are not a hindrance, that they are not one that is uh, like leaven inside of a loaf. It makes the whole loaf ruined. It's very important that we separate, and we are separated in that day, and God sees fit of that. But Father is a good God. He's given everybody free will and a chance. You say, well, is that why people are the way they are today? Well, it's because of uh, this free will. Uh, they've exercised more of the free will than that of the will of God. They do what they want to do, what makes them happy. And when one feels in that type of way, and uh, it's normally a destructive way, and uh, they, they, they find their fate pretty, pretty quick. Verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing question? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. In other words, 
these sparrows are sold for the, the, the smallest amount uh, in that day. I mean, even less than a penny. And he says here, are, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father knowing it. In other words, God knows of everything. If he knows the hairs of your head, if he knows where you are and the thoughts that go through your mind, he knows exactly uh, that of the, of the sparrow when one falls. And that's what he says, verse 30. But the very hairs of your head are numbered, 31. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are more valuable than many sparrows. 32. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. When will that be, Brother Randall? That happens every day. Every day. Jesus is up there making intercessory for you and I. Why does he have to make intercessory for you and I today? Because, for one, we are still in the flesh. We are fallible. And for two, uh, the accuser of the brethren is still there. And he's accusing you and I day and night of the things that you and I have done. Even though we go through, that's what he says here in verse 32, Whosoever there shall for confess me before men, will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Romans 1, 16, it says, Be ye not, let me read that to you. <clears throat> Romans 1 and 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he's saying, if you confess me before men, in other words, you lead them to me, you tell them how to get out of their problems, how that there is a Savior of the world that loves them and provides for them. Then, therefore, they come to the knowledge of Christ. And once that one has come to the knowledge of Christ, they are no longer to be on the milk. They need the meat of the word. They need the meat of God's word to sustain them throughout the rest of their life and be prepared. Verse 33. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. This is why traditions of man is so dangerous. Had somebody asked me once before, well, what makes it so dangerous about the rapture theory? Because it gives people false hope. It gives them hope where there is no hope. Whosoever shall deny me before men, when one teaches a rapture theory, that's what they're doing. They're denying the power of God and placing it on a fairy tale. It's not popular, friends. It's not good to be involved in traditions of man. Verse 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I am come not to send peace but a sword. That's the words of Christ. I've not come to set the world at peace. Now, <laughs> the peace that this world is gaining is false peace. That peace that's going to come within the next little bit. The Bible says when they say peace, peace, then come a sudden destruction as a woman upon travail. That meaning that when the Antichrist comes, how is he going to come? He's going to come prosperously and peacefully. What's the opposite of prosperity and the opposite of peaceful? We know that these things will transpire before the coming of the Antichrist. So when he comes, he has an audience of those that will be looking. Many people of today are wondering how come uh, they haven't been raptured out yet. They're wondering how come the rapture hasn't come because there's been enough turmoil in the world. You see, the Bible teaches us that there is no thing as a rapture. There is nothing that will 
uh, take you away and pull you from uh, the tribulation. The Bible teaches us that we will go through the tribulation, but that we are not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation. Why is that? Are we better than the next guy? No, you're not better. No, you're not better, but you have learned what you are to do, how you are to wait upon the Lord, and that you are to keep his commandments and his statutes. So he said again in verse 34, Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I am come not to send peace, but a sword. What is this sword? It's the word of God. Revelations 1 and 16. <clears throat> Revelations chapter 1 and verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. In other words, that what comes out of the mouth of Christ is the word. So that's what he's come to do. He has come in that not to bring traditions of man, but to bring the word of God. The word that you need to sustain you. 35. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The reason why this is is because of the word. Because the word will make a division. It always has. There's been many, 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 many wars over the Bible, over the word. And therefore, we see that it is not only in the world, but in our homes. Not everybody is going to see it the way you see it. Not everybody is going to understand it. Not everybody is predestined to know the Word of God. Think yourself loved of God. Thank God that He has shown you the way of His Word. And not be lost in Babylon. Thank God that we are uh, like Zerubbabel. We have come out of the confusion. We have come out of Babylon and now we are standing on our own two feet. And that's what God expects you to do. He said that they would be against her mother and her mother or daughter and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Not everybody sees it the same way. Verse 36. And a man's foes shall be they of his own house. Did you see that? A man's foe shall be they of his own house. We see that pretty prevalent today. There's a lot of people that have members in their home, members in their family, that just won't take heed to the word of God, that just won't listen. Plead with them and you, you speak with them and you try your best to help them but yet they won't listen to the word of God. And destruction is on their way. 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I guess the question is, which takes priority in your life? In other words, he is not saying that you're not supposed to love your father. You're not supposed to love your mother. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that you are to love them less and him more. This concept is misunderstood by many people. And it's important that you know that God is the one that is teaching you. Even though you were born into that family, your soul was before and it has come through the womb of a woman in that family to be a part of father sends special needs people into certain families and that's what a blessing is is uh, that 
God knows that this mother or this father will take care of this special needs individual. But those that are not of special need, that should have common sense and understanding, uh, there is need that you teach them. But you are to love God more than they. And that's what God's asked, that we put all of our love and our energy toward him. Not to forsake our family, but to love him. Hosea 6, 6, he says, he says uh, uh, that he wants our love, our mercy, more than sacrifice. And the knowledge of God, of God more than burnt offerings. So that's, that's exactly what he's after. All right. Verse 37, or excuse me, 38. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. I guess the question would be asked, do you know what a cross is for? A cross is to be crucified on. And Jesus is saying to his apostles, listen, that a man that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. There's going to be persecution. There's going to be trial in this walk of life. And it's to see whether or not you will withstand. Are you capable of withstanding? Are you willing to go even to death for God's word? In this near future, you may see that. That's the question that's asked. It's not a popular question. Granted, you're not going to hear that in the secular church, but that's what he's saying. That he wants you to know that it's important that you, when you want to be a Christ man, you want to be a Christ woman, you want to be as close to Christ as you possibly can, do you remember what they've done to him? Verse 39. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Is it all about you or is it about Christ? And that's the thing. Many people today, they concern themselves about what they want and what they were wanting to do and what pleases them. That's getting in the flesh, friends. We are to get away from the flesh and be in the spiritual knowledge of God and understand what pleases God. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. You shall find life eternal. That's what Christ is saying. Verse 40. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. And again, not everybody receives the word of God like they should. Not everybody is uh, receptive of God's word because of what has been put into their minds, these traditions of man, and uh, it goes against everything that they believe. And that's what the Bible teaches, that uh, traditions of man makes void the word of God. And... Uh, if you're going to receive Jesus, then you must receive his word and his plan. 41. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. What he's saying here is when you find a ministry worthy support it. When you find a ministry that's worthy of God's work and his will, you should support it. Now, there are different types of support. There are tithes and offerings. It's not about that, but there are tithes and offerings, and there are prayers that can be brought out for that ministry. For those that want to be a part of God's ministry, then you should pray for them. I'm talking about those that teach God's word line upon line and precept upon precept. Again, in this day that we're in, Amos 8 and 11 is very prevalent. There's a famine in the land today. I hope everybody knows that. 
that there is a famine in the land today, and it's not of bread and water, but of the hearing of the Word of God. Not everybody's going to be able to hear it. Not everybody's going to be attentive to it. So again, he that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And there are rewards that are given. When one tithes or uh, one gives offering or one lifts up prayers for friends, there are rewards that come back to you because God said that. He said he would do that for you. Verse 42 to come to a close. And whosoever shall give a drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. <laughs> you know what this uh, cup of cold water is? It's the living water. When you take and you lead one of his little ones, and it doesn't mean that... Uh, the age of 10 or so. He's talking about anybody that does not know Christ. Anybody that does not know. He said here, And whosoever shall give a drink unto the one of these little ones a, a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. He sees when you promote his word or helping one out of his own. God sees that. Again, he keeps great records, and he knows exactly when one needs to be brought forth, and he brings them your way. Many times I've seen people come my way and uh, get an opportunity in that to open up a door of knowledge and wisdom for them. And some have been saved but just do not understand the Word of God. And some have never even accepted Christ as their personal Savior. When you have that grand opportunity, friend, and that door is open for you, it's expected for you to step through. And if you do that, and the Bible says that you shall in no wise lose your reward. You can't outgive God. You'll never be able to outgive God. God will reward you openly. And he'll do that so that people will see and give honor unto him. Not to you, not to me, but give God the honor and the glory. That's Matthew chapter 10. We'll be in uh, Matthew chapter 11 on our next lecture. We hope that something's been said this morning to encourage you and to help you. We pray that uh, things are good with you and your family. We ask that you would pray for Fresh Start. And we'll pray for you. Until the next time, may the Lord richly bless.